Join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 First, you have some time to look at questions. Okay, so it's Millie's turn to give her tutorial today, isn't it? That's right. I'm going to talk about renewable energy sources, and specifically solar towers. I'm not sure how much you already know about solar towers, so I thought I'd start with a few questions. First of all, does anyone know how solar towers work? Don't they somehow use the sun's energy to create electricity? Yes, in a way. They actually work by using the sun to make columns of hot air that rise upwards through the center of the tower. Now, do you know how old this idea is? Mm, I would have thought it was a 20th century idea. That's when we've had to start thinking about how to solve energy problems, isn't it? No, I read something about this last week. The first time solar energy was produced was in the 17th century, wasn't it? That's right. So it's not a modern idea at all. And Leonardo da Vinci also made sketches of a solar tower, though he never actually built one. Their recent history starts really with a man called Jörg Schlake. Yes, I read about him. He's a professor from Germany, and he needed a country with plenty of sunshine and land for his research, so he chose Spain to build the first tower. Correct. Well... Everyone seems to know something about these towers. Yes, but I still don't really understand how they work. Well, I've made a flowchart to help you. Firstly, you have to realize that they are very tall towers. They're constructed out of high-strength concrete, and they can be as high as 1,000 feet. There's one being built in Australia that's one kilometer high. Now, all around the base of the tower, they have a sunlight collector, which is basically a large sheet of plastic. It extends out for as much as seven kilometers, and it is raised off the ground slightly so it heats up the air underneath it. So it acts like a greenhouse, then? That's exactly right. In fact, they plan to try and grow plants underneath it as well. So what happens to the air? Well, the sunlight collector heats it to 65 degrees centigrade. That's on average 35 degrees greater than the outside temperature. And the laws of physics mean that this hot air rises up the chimney or the tower and drives the turbines at the top. As the turbines revolve, they generate electricity. In fact, they can generate 200 megawatts of power, or enough for 200,000 houses. Wow, that sounds impressive. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions... But it can't all be good news. What are the disadvantages? I'll bet they're really expensive to operate. Well, no, not necessarily. Because sunlight is free, after all. So it's really only the initial outlay that is costly. After that, they're very efficient. But what about at night, when there is no sun? Well, they've managed to find a way to store the electricity produced during the day, so it's no problem at night, or even on cloudy days. So there are no drawbacks, then? Ah, 
I didn't say that. One problem they do have is that a lot of the energy in the sunlight is lost from the collector in the form of heat, and then, of the remaining heat, a large proportion escapes from the top of the tower. But they are still worth the investment because, as I said, sunlight is free. Hang on, if these towers are so tall, how do they cope in high winds? Surely they become dangerous then. Yes, keeping them stable is another drawback. I believe they anchor the towers to the ground with wires to stabilize them, so they're not dangerous. But it is an issue. You have certainly found an interesting topic today. So thanks, Millie. Perhaps we can have a look at your pictures now. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a guide giving instructions to a group of international students in Canada, preparing for a whale watching trip. Before you hear the talk, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Hello, everyone. Glad to see so many happy faces on this wild and windy day. Are you all ready to go looking for whales? I'm Tony, and our other guide today is Dale. We'll be using these two rubber boats you see here, and our trip today will take three hours. In a few minutes, we'll be heading into part of the largest temperate rainforest of the Pacific Northwest. I'll show you our route on the map here. This is where we are now. We'll be leaving the sheltered bay and heading out across the mouth of the bay toward the open water. As you know, last night there were strong winds in the area, so we can't go out into the ocean as we had planned. Near the mouth, the water will be quite rough. That's where we are most likely to spot orcas, or killer whales, as they are also called. After crossing the mouth of the bay, we'll enter the calmer, shallower waters. This is where you look for gray whales. Then we will continue up this narrow inlet, close to the shore. You will have a great view of giant fir and cedar trees that have never been logged. Here is the place to watch for wildlife. You are likely to see bears along the shore and eagles in the sky overhead. Right at the back of the inlet here are the hot springs where we will be stopping for an hour. You can have a soothing soak in bubbling hot water before the return trip. I'll tell you a little bit about the whales now because with the noise of the wind and the engine, you won't be able to hear much out there. As we head out in the boat, we will probably see dolphins first. They are a grey colour and quite small. One to two meters long, they will swim right beside the boat, racing along and sometimes jumping out of the water just ahead of us. They swim very fast, and they are playful and curious. They're really fun to watch. The next ones we'll see are orcas or killer whales, which are actually members of the dolphin family. They are seven to eight meters long, very fast. And they have sharp teeth. Some stay in these waters all year round. We identify them by the distinctive black and white color. They feed mainly on salmon in these waters, but the orca diet can include seabirds, seals, 
dolphins, and other mammals. They can be fierce hunters, and this is why they are called killer whales. We should start watching for them as soon as we get out toward open water. We're likely to spot the orcas from a considerable distance. Watch for the black and white marking and mist spouting from the blowholes on top of their heads. Just outside the inlet is where we will probably see gray whales. The grays are migratory. They pass through here twice a year, moving from far in the north where they feed to the warm southern waters where they breed. You are very lucky today because several have been reported in the area. Unlike the orcas, greys are solitary, except when you see a mother with a calf. The grey whales are much longer and heavier than the orcas, 14 meters long and weighing up to 30 tons. The grey whales are filter feeders, gathering tiny ghost shrimp from the sand at the bottom. We recognize greys from their tail fins because each one is different. Once we find the whales, we'll come up as close as we can safely. We are allowed to approach the whales no closer than 50 meters, but that feels pretty close when you are in the presence of animals this big. You'll see mist coming out of the blowholes when they breathe out, and you'll hear a loud hiss. If we are downwind, we might even be able to smell them, a strong, fishy smell. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now, for just a few words of caution. It will be quite bouncy out there, especially in the front of the boat. If you want a smoother ride, stay in the middle of the boat, close to the engine. Hold on to the ropes and keep an eye on any big waves. Be alert so you don't get thrown out of the boat. In case of an emergency, you are all wearing survival suits. They'll keep you warm and dry in or out of the water. They are bright orange for visibility. The water temperature is around 8 degrees. Without these suits, you would only last a few minutes in this cold water. With these suits, your survival time is increased dramatically. They will keep you upright in the water even if you can't swim. But we don't expect anybody to end up in the water, so don't worry. Now, are there any questions? I'm afraid of getting seasick. Right. I was just coming to that. If you think you might get seasick, take one of these patches and put it on your arm at the wrist. Like this. It works on pressure points of the body and will relieve seasickness without the drowsiness you can get from pills. Are there any other questions? All right, then. Let's start loading up the boats. We leave in five minutes. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student, Penny, talking to two friends, Ray and Louise, about a television competition Ray has entered called Travel Documentary. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 
21 to 26. Hi, haven't seen you two in ages. What have you been up to? Hi Penny, Ray is really excited. He's just been shortlisted for travel documentary. He could be off travelling around the world for three months. Travel documentary? What's that? You've never heard of it? Don't you watch TV? Well actually, no, hardly ever. Especially since I've started working on my thesis. I don't have time to breathe, let alone watch TV. So what's this all about, Ray? Well, actually, it, it's a competition run by Public TV. It involves my two great loves, travel and filmmaking. Is it that program where people are sent around the world making documentary videos? I have heard of it. Fantastic! So you've been chosen? Not yet. I'm one of 34 selected for an interview next week, so I've made it through the first cut. Yeah, there were over 200 applicants from around the country. Pretty amazing, hey? Well, I've been lucky so far. What's the next stage? 13 are chosen from the interview to do a four-week training course in documentary filmmaking. Then... The eight finalists get sent off with a video camera to travel around the world. Sounds incredible. What's the catch? The catch is that every two weeks you have to send in a ten-minute video from a different part of the world. It's broadcast on TV along with the work of three of the other competitors and judged by a panel of experts and the TV audience. So you're under a lot of pressure. Wow, I guess so. You mean you're on television every two weeks? Yep, that's right. But first I have to be selected. Do you have to have any filmmaking experience to apply? Some background in photography or video making helps. But you're not supposed to be an expert. In fact, you can't apply if you've already worked in filmmaking. We all get the same four-week course, so we start with the same skills. Can you go anywhere in the world you want? Each competitor makes up his or her own travel plans and has to get them approved. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Have you talked with anyone else who has done it? As a matter of fact, just last week, I met Sarah Price, a girl from here who did it last year. What did she have to say about it? She said it was the most amazing experience of her life, but it was really tough at times. I think you'd have to be really brave to take off like that alone with so much responsibility. It's not like going on a holiday, is it? <laughs> no. Two weeks in a country often where you can't speak the language to find a story, film it, organise all the editing. Then you're off to a completely different part of the world to start all over again. Pretty exhausting, but exciting too. What a way to see the world. What about Sarah Price? Did she have any bad experiences? She said the worst part was when she got some mysterious fever in Mongolia and thought she might have to be sent home. Fortunately, it got better, but she said it was scary to feel really ill when you're alone so far away. So what made you want to apply? 
When I saw the program on TV a while ago, I thought, this is for me. I've always wanted to travel, but needed to work for a year before I could even think about it. Then a new series started up. I thought, now's my chance. Don't you think you'll be lonely? I don't think I'll have time to be homesick. I'm more worried about having too much to do and not enough time to get things organised. So we might be watching you on television in the next few months. I hope so, if I'm lucky. When will you know for sure? They choose the final eight in March. A month later, you're on your way. So do you have to pay anything? Nothing. It's all paid for. Course, camera, flights, accommodation and in-country travel. The budget is pretty tight, though. No extras. I sure hope you get it. Then I'll be finding time to watch at least one program on television every week. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk given by Kate Tomalin on the history of technology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Our talk today in this History of Technology series is about a feat of anti-engineering from the late 19th and early 20th century that is still very much with us today and that is linked with the history of the typewriter. It's the QWERTY keyboard. What you might ask is QWERTY. Well, have a look at the nearest typewriter or computer keyboard. If you look at the top row, you will see that Q, W, E, R, T, Y are the first six letters. Did you ever think when you were learning to type about why the letters on the keyboard are distributed the way they are? Here's the story. It all has to do with the history of the typewriter. Typewriters existed since the early 1700s, but the first commercially practical system came into being in 1873. The typewriter is one of America's greatest unsung inventions. While the telephone, automobile, and airplane sped up communications and transportation, the typewriter did the same thing for the written word. But few people paid much attention possibly because they were too busy reading what the typewriter had written about all the other inventions. The first typewriters had the keys laid out in alphabetical order, but this system had problems. Some keys that tended to be typed together were physically close. This made the type bars hit each other and get stuck. Typewriters in 1873 jammed or got stuck if the keys next to each other were hit in quick succession. To solve this problem, in 1878, the QWERTY keyboard was developed, spacing frequent letters away from each other and therefore reducing the number of jams. It was not specifically designed to slow down typist, as is generally believed, but the keyboard did create a built-in inefficiency for typists. The most common keys are scattered all over the keyboard rows, many on the left side. Right-handed people have to use their left hand, which is the weaker hand. Typewriter technology improved, doing away with the original rationale for the QWERTY distribution. But the keyboard remained. In spite of its inefficiency, it is the keyboard we all use today.
Already back in 1932, there was a solution to the problem. Efficiency expert August Dvorak came up with a new keyboard layout. His home row consisted of A O E U I D H T N S, which includes all of the vowels as well as the most commonly used letters. On this keyboard, over three thousand words can be typed using only the home row. In fact, seventy percent of all the work can be done on the home row, twenty-two percent on the row above, and eight percent on the row below. The QWERTY keyboard allows only about fifty words to be typed without reaching for other rows. In addition. On Dvorak's keyboard, the right hand handles 56 percent of the workload, and the left handles 44 percent, just about the opposite of the division of the QWERTY keyboard. This is an advantage for most right-handers. The Dvorak keyboard increased accuracy in typing by almost 50 percent, and speed by 15 to 20 percent. How much labor did this Dvorak layout save? In one study, a group of typists was evaluated in the use of both keyboards. Those using the Dvorak keyboard moved their fingers just about one mile on an average day, while those who used the QWERTY keyboard moved their fingers an average of twelve to twenty miles. The superiority of the Dvorak keyboard was clearly established. However, it has never been adopted as the keyboard of choice. Why? First of all, bad luck and bad timing on the part of the Dvorak team. First, there was the depression. Not a good time for introducing change. But the main factor that worked against the Dvorak system was habit. People were used to the QWERTY keyboard. Computers today could easily switch the arrangement of letters to the Dvorak layout, but it seemed that because of habit, the QWERTY layout remains dominant. People felt comfortable with the keyboard they learned on, so it was the established patterns of hundreds of millions of typists, manufacturers, typing teachers, and typewriter salespeople that have crushed all moves toward keyboard efficiency for over seventy years. It looks like QWERTY keyboard may be with us for a long time yet. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.